All right. Uh, I think that the uh, entries are slowing down. It's kind of like watching a, you know, popcorn in the microwave, right? When it slows down to a certain point, then you know you're good to go. So I think we're gonna we're gonna start uh, this next session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Lukachko. I am a professor at the University of Toronto. I teach in the Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design. Uh, I'm also a building science consultant and have spent quite a bit of time, several decades actually, uh, working on high performance buildings. So I, I know that you are going to receive a ton of information over the next couple days. And I know probably just based on what you've been exposed to this morning already, it's probably feeling pretty complicated. Uh, and certainly uh, a high degree of challenge for this exercise this week. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about setting targets for high performance buildings. And I hope to try and make it seem a little bit easier, or at least give you a starting point that can uh, try and accomplish all of this. Uh, I do have the chat open so I can see uh, questions as they come in. Uh, but I'd also ask, like, don't hesitate to, to put up your hand and, and we can we can probably unmute you during the presentation. Certainly there'll be time uh, for, for questions later. All right, so here we go. This is what we're gonna talk about in the next hour or so. Uh, I wanna first uh, start off with uh, talking about setting goals in the climate crisis context, because I think that that's, you know, you got a sense of that from the last presentation from the city of Toronto they are thinking about what we can do to address the built environment's responsibility for the climate crisis, the impact that our buildings have. Uh, and, and that really is for any goal setting with respect to uh, new buildings or, or renovation of existing buildings. We, this is really the context for our design work. So I'm gonna talk about that first. And then uh, I'm going to talk about high performance buildings generally, a little bit about what we mean by high performance buildings. And finally, I'll give you some starting points, uh, an approach uh, for, for you to, to, to set off with. And then I I'm hoping that a lot of the other information uh, that you get this week is going to plug into this as well. You will note a fair bit of repetition, I think, between the different speakers that you're going to, you're going to see this or hear from this week. And I think a large part of that repetition has to do with the climate crisis itself. As I said, this is, this is the starting point for our design. And when we're thinking about uh, any kind of new construction, this is, is something we really have to be focused on. So you'll, you'll, you'll hear many people give you essentially the same message, but maybe in a slightly different, a different way. I'm sure that all of you are familiar with this kind of chart. And this is a little bit out of date, this particular one, but it will serve for this discussion. And what you're seeing here is the, the actual climate data, the global mean temperature. Uh, and on the left hand side here, the black spiky line, you see the actual variation in, in climate on the historical side. And then on the right hand side of this graph going forward, you see several different lines, which, which really describe scenarios uh, that relate to how well we as a global society can reduce our, our climate emissions. And what each one of those scenarios implies is a different uh, level of global warming over, over the, uh, in, well, the entire, the entire globe. Uh, there's, I think, some key points that we should be thinking about from a design perspective when we look at a chart like this. Uh, one key one is that, yep, there's plenty of variability in the past and there's a fair bit of uncertainty about the future. In the short term, each one of these different pathways that we might be on uh, is, looks pretty similar. You know, so if we're just thinking about what's happening in the next decade or two decades, it almost as if, it will be as if we're on the same path in each one of those cases. However, once we get beyond 2050, the impact of the emissions uh, really uh, will lead us into quite a different realm. And so on the, on the right hand side there, you've got on, on the one hand, a mitigation scenario where our climate is very similar to what it has been in the past. And, you know, a business as usual scenario where we're really thinking about quite a different world. Now for a designer of, of a building, 
thinking about the year 2022 and contemplating a new building or a major retrofit to a building that is going to last for another 80 to 100 years, these kind of graphs really show us what the climate may be like in a very relevant way. This is the climate that your building will be dealing with, and it could be in anywhere in this, in this particular range. So this, this is really the uncertain future that we need to figure out how to design for. And you're, you're probably also all aware, uh, partly because this has been in the news and talked about uh, so much recently, but also because of uh, advanced codes and standards like the Toronto Green Standard, which you just heard about, we have a very small period of time to, to, to make an impact on our, our total emissions and really decide uh, as a global society which pathway we're going to be on. We've probably got about two decades, maybe a little bit more than that, in order to uh, reduce our emissions. So there's a very narrow window of, of time in order, to, uh, in, in order to make an impact. So this is also a, a very relevant fact for building designers as well. So we have kind of two things combined here. We have to be thinking about what the very long term is and designing for the uncertainty in the future. And we also have to be focused on mitigating emissions in the very short term. Uh, and th this is uh, really new stuff in terms of, of what building designers have had to deal with. So, okay, so this is, the, this is the big point. To design for the climate crisis, you must think both about how to mitigate short-term emissions, and you've already heard some conversation about operational emissions and embodied emissions in buildings. We have to look for ways to reduce those emissions over the next couple decades. And we also have to think about how the building will adapt to this changing climate over the very long term. And that long term that we're talking about is approximately the next 80 to 100 years, which corresponds quite closely to the service life that we would expect for, for new construction. So we, we have to do both of those things. And, and just to emphasize the point about why the long term is, or the dynamics in, in terms of the long term, I just wanted to, to give you one more background piece on, on how the timeline works for climate change. If you were to think from today forward into the future, uh, where any action that we take to reduce our emissions should result in a new equilibrium, which will result in a stable climate at some point in the future. Where that is, well, we can measure kind of the magnitude of, of that over, over the long term. Uh, but if we were to, to talk about this in terms of trends over the long term, uh, we, can, we can kind of map it this way, just to get a sense of, of, of really how this climate change works relative to emissions past and emissions that, uh, that we can hope to avoid over the very short term. So here's a, a time scale. And in this time scale, we've got 100 years, like what we'd be thinking about for designing new buildings and then projecting out even, even 1,000 years from that. Some of these trends are going to take you know, this period of time. Here's a curve that represents our CO2 emissions, and it's an optimistic one. It shows that uh, our emissions are, are, are going to peak, and over the next you know, 30, 40 years, we're going to put in place strong mitigation efforts, and we're going to bring those emissions down to zero or close to zero in a very short period of time. That's what that curve looks like, and then we end up uh, stabilizing our emissions as we go forward. If we were to do that, the actual temperature change uh, or sort of the CO2 stabilization in the atmosphere will take another century or so. It might take another couple hundred years for the, the emissions that we've been generating uh, you know, over the past 150 years to kind of reach stabilization in, in, the, uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, if that is uh, done, then we can expect uh, that there's that the temperature will stabilize, but that will take several more centuries to, to make that happen. And this this just goes to show you the the lag, the impact of those past and and uh, those past emissions, and also the emissions that are going to happen in the in the very short window of time coming up. They're going to take a long time to really finalize the impact on our climate. 
And if we go even, you know, to think about this, some of these climate change impacts, and we're not going to thankfully have to deal with sea level rise in Toronto, but just as an example, the impact of that new temperature regime globally will continue to change our climate in some key ways over perhaps millennia. So this is, this is really a long-term thing. We're not going to have to worry about most of what happens past 100 years because that's out of our lifespan, out of our time frame for most buildings. But this is, is the, these are the trends and the kind of inertia behind them that we have to be thinking about as designers as we, as we go forward. Okay, so it's a very long-term thing, but certainly related to, uh, to buildings. So back to this chart, just to get it, pull a little bit more detail here. I mentioned that on the left-hand side, you've got the variability of climate. There's a, a straight horizontal line in this, in this graph as well that is representative of the building code climate data that we use for designing buildings. This is implicit in our codes. It's built into our codes a sense of what the climate is, uh, and, and that's what we're designing to uh, currently. Uh, but it's historical. So anything that's in the building code as a kind of minimum standard is really using out-of-date climate data, uh, if you like. Uh, what's really key for us thinking about the future is where do we set the bar for future performance? So we're designing buildings that are going to last for 80 to 100 years. This, this uh, right-hand side horizontal black line kind of represents that 80 to 100 year period of time that these buildings are going to be in operation. Uh, as a designer, a pretty key question is where do we set that bar? Are we, are we going to uh, predict that uh, business as usual situation is going to happen and our climate is going to be significantly different than it is right now? Or are we going to think that it's closer to mitigation these are decisions that we have to make today that are really going to have a big impact over the full service life of that, that building. And of course, this also affects uh, any building that has already been built. And on the project you're working on, you have kind of both of these aspects. You have to think about how are we going to adapt what is, has already been built, been built to a building code code that uh, set standards at a, a completely different historical climate. We have to bring that up to a performance level that is appropriate for the future. Okay, so these are, these are the big challenges. And we need to remember as designers that we're not really talking about climate impacts that are just about temperature. Uh, you know, we talk about global uh, temperature rise, but, but that's just one indicator of uh, global climate, not really something that directly impacts buildings. Uh, buildings are impacted through the results of that climate change. So if we were to break it down into design parameters that we would be thinking about, uh, well, heat, moisture, wind, all elements of the climate regime that our buildings uh, need to, to deal with in terms of environmental separation between inside and outside. Uh, we're gonna be dealing with heat waves, warmer winters, cold snaps, uh, daily temperature ranges that are, are going to change or adjust over time, uh, very likely drier and warmer su summers, uh, changing uh, it, even just the temperature of the water supply in the city will, will be an impact. On the moisture side, uh, we have storms, we have higher humidity, potential water shortages, flooding with wind, stronger winds and stronger storm intensity. All of these are the, the impacts related to climate, the climate changing or the changing parameters that we can design for directly. And I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but I, I want you guys to be thinking about this as you approach this building project, both for that heritage component that needs to be retrofit and any new construction, to be thinking about what the future uh, climate parameters are, are likely to be and how you would think about accommodating those. That long-term thinking is going to be pretty crucial to the adaptation part to future climate change. Okay. So how should the climate crisis influence our, our thinking about design? Well, we need to design to minimize emissions over the next two decades. That's an imperative. And that, that should be front and center in all of your thinking. We've got a very limited amount of time to mitigate that future climate change. And if we can minimize emissions over the next two decades, we have a better chance of having a more uh, normal, if you like, climate over the full service life of the building. That has, a, that has a big big impact and therefore it's top of the list. We do need to think about minimizing emissions over the building's 
full, full life cycle. So the next two decades are pretty important, but we're also going to be designing the building from cradle to grave, uh, thinking about the, the full carbon emissions over the, the building's life cycle. That is important to do as well because of that continue, continuing impact of emissions in, in the atmosphere. So we're, we're going to, the, these first two bullet points are all around mitigating future climate change, but we know that there is going to be some climate change. You could see that in the graph already. There, we are projecting a, a, a warming climate. So anything that we design now has to be designed to anticipate that future climate. And a key design decision, as I've said, for you as a designer is to anticipate what level of future climate change is there's likely to be so that you could design an appropriate building for that. That's that's a pretty pretty big challenge. So these are the key background pieces that should influence our thinking uh, and your thinking in particular when we're talking about this project uh, for uh, both the new and existing buildings. And this is pretty different. This this context is pretty different than the way we would have done things even just five years ago. I'll give you. Uh, an example here of a high performance building that was designed uh, a little bit more than five years ago, finished construction in tw uh, 2018. This is the, the Joyce Center for Partnership and Innovation, not too far away from Toronto. This building is built in uh, Hamilton for Mohawk College. Uh, it started with design objectives that uh, included, uh, uh, th these are the targets that, that they use to inform the design created a, a net zero energy building. So a building that uh, generated as much energy over the course of the year as it used in operation over the course of the year. Those two things balancing each other out. Another design objective was to create a, a living lab uh, for students because this is all about education. And there was a stretch goal for this project to, to think about the whole life cycle carbon. So not just the operational energy, but also to consider uh, the embodied energy that goes into this in this building uh, overall. And Adam is pointing out that he mentioned this and you can also find a ton of information about this building because it was one of the first uh, zero carbon building challenge, uh, the, uh, the first version of the Canadian Green Building Council program. Uh, to go through and, and reach that certification. Uh, and, and that also, of course, uh, ties into these goals uh, to create a living lab to teach about high performance design. So this building started off with very high standards, but largely focused on that energy balance uh, during, during operation. And I'll, I'll talk about how this kind of worked out. So this building was designed for, for low loads, a very efficient building enclosure, uh, good solar control, uh, very efficient use of energy. You can see a diagram here of a lot of the technology that went into this building itself, including uh, ground source uh, uh, heat pumps um, to take advantage of that stable ground temperature. It's all electric. This has been mentioned already in, in the morning. Uh, moving to, to a very low carbon uh, approach. So very efficient and use of energy within the building complex itself. And then if you, if you saw that first picture of the building, uh, a large amount of renewable energy, those actually you can just see it in the diagram here, uh, these large solar panels that cover the entire new facility and then also some of the rooftops of adjacent buildings as well in order to generate on site uh, clean uh, electricity to balance off the energy use of the building itself. So all of these things were, were kind of done together. It was designed using an energy budget approach. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, uh, part of a spreadsheet that evaluates a whole bunch of different combinations of building enclosure and mechanical system possibilities to look at the, the total energy use that would be uh, involved with each one of those combinations and to try and keep that within an amount of energy use that would relate to this, the, the amount that could be generated on site. Uh, and the idea here with an energy budget is you're, you're kind of saying we can generate this much energy on site and we know that we need energy for lighting, equipment, heating, cooling inside the building, uh, circulating ventilation air, hot water. Uh, 
each one of those end uses of energy gets a portion of that budget and then all the design work is done to make sure that uh, the systems and the, the loads first and then the systems are all controlled within that budget itself. Definitely possible to do, but again, all focused on this whole budget is focused on that operational energy. And that really only gets one part of the, the big picture that we need to we need to get to. So you're going to be doing something very similar to this in your analysis as you move through through the week. And here, here's the result, at least for the for the first year. What you're what you're seeing is a year of data. Uh, the blue bars, don't worry about the different shades so much, just the blue and orange. Blue represents the amount of energy used each month through operation. Orange represents the amount of energy generated. And you can see that there's not a, this energy generated is all coming from the photovoltaic array on the rooftop of the building. Not as much energy generated in the, the winter months, uh, lots of energy generated in the summertime months. You can see a bit of a load profile here for energy use throughout the year, a little bit less uh, when the building is not in, a, in use uh, for educational purposes in the, the summer months or in between terms. Uh, but when we add up all of this and, and do that balance over the year, uh, we were able to generate for this, this project, oh, sorry, I'll go back, uh, actually more energy than the building used uh, on an annual basis. And that, so that kind of checks the box on the net zero part of this, this equation. So how do these, these numbers work? And if we, if we think just about the operational energy of the building uh, on operating emissions, Excellent. This building was designed uh, to, to make sure that that energy generated was, uh, was greater than the energy used in the building and, and in fact actually ended up with a little bit of surplus energy uh, that could be used elsewhere on the building campus uh, or otherwise offset some other emissions on, on the project. But as we've been talking about so far this morning, that's only part of the picture. And we really have to be thinking about that full life cycle context. If we were to think about the embodied emissions, uh, there was a study done to look at what about all the emissions that are associated with the structure, the building enclosure, everything that goes into the, the building uh, that uh, in the construction of the building itself. Here's a, a rough totaling of that, uh, not including every single material, but just focusing on some of those bigger aspects, primary, primary structure and also the building enclosure, the, the by weight, certainly the, the large volume of material that goes into the project. We see here something like 4.5 million kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent if we add up all of those emissions. Um, if you think back to the discussion uh, a few minutes ago about the context for decision-making, all of these embodied emissions occur right at the beginning of the project. So if you the operating emissions, they will be offset over the whole life cycle of the building by the energy that's generated by the photovoltaic array. But what we put into the construction of the building happens on day one. So those, those emissions are, are definitely at the beginning of the project. And they would certainly for a new building be in that 20 year, maybe 30 year time frame where we have to do everything we can to reduce the emissions. So they're, they're pretty important. So if we were to do some very rough math on this. Uh, we've got some positive energy generation uh, for the first year is just over 90,000 kilowatt hours. And that is going to reduce, that's going to offset uh, emissions uh, for the, the energy use. And we could use that to kind of pay back that embodied carbon in the building itself. But that's that first year of net positive energy generation is, is only going to get us about 70,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalent in that first year. And although the grid is going to get cleaner and cleaner over time, uh, you could use this as kind of a rough number for how much uh, offset that net positive energy is going to be. If we compare that to the 4.5 million kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent, it would take about 60 years of, of operational savings to pay off that embodied energy. Um, so 60 years, well, that's a long time to get to zero. The issue with that are, is kind of twofold. Uh, one is we, we have to be thinking as designers, is this 
you know, to get to zero carbon for both embodied and operational, is this even reasonable in the, the context of the building lifespan itself? Luckily for the Joyce Center uh, uh, for Partnership and Innovation, it's a university building. It's, uh, it's going to last for 80 to 100 years. It's gonna be well cared for during that period of time. So 60 year payback, that's, that's uh, reasonable, to, uh, reasonable to assume. Uh, but 60 years is much outside of that very short term that we have to reduce emissions. And so if we were to design this building again, we would probably be doing many of the same things. We would be looking for that energy balance where we're generating more energy than what was used, but we would make probably very different decisions about what went into the construction of the building in order to lower that 4.5 million kilograms of carbon dioxide that is the embodied emissions in the building in order to reduce the payback. Those, the time value of when those emissions are made is, is pretty enormous and we have a much higher attention to that. So that's, that's an example of a high performance building that happened uh, even just five years ago uh, done by an excellent design team with high goals set for, for the project. Uh, but when we think now about the changing context for what we as designers need to do for, for addressing the climate crisis, we, we really have to take more into account. All right, so that, that kind of covers off each one of these, these elements. And I think you can, you can see the complexity that, that needs to be added to your thinking about the building, both short-term and, and long-term. Let's get to some starting points here for how to make this how to make this work. You've already seen one quite obvious starting point for this. The Toronto Green Standard is uh, is, a, is a, a standard that that's specifically designed to reach those very low emissions targets for the built environment in the city of Toronto. Uh, as was explained in the last presentation, it's divided up into a number of different sections. Uh, you can see the tiered approach where the industry is going to be moved from, you know, kind of what we're building right now uh, very quickly to low energy buildings. As a starting point for you and your project, I would suggest that you can skip directly to the end. What we're, we're going to be focusing on uh, is not so much the transition, how to get from tier one to tier three, but the end result. Uh, for any building, certainly that is city owned, we have to get to net zero emissions. Uh, and if you want targets that relate to the total energy use, that's the, the TUI up here, total energy use intensity, and also the thermal energy demand intensity, and also thinking about greenhouse gas emissions as, a, as an intensity per square meter, uh, these tier three targets would be the absolute minimum that you would start with for a building that's designed to, to match up with that, that climate crisis context that we, we need to work with. So that's, that's an easy answer, I guess, as, as a starting point. How to get there may be a little bit more complicated. And I, I think that we can, we can give you a pathway forward uh, using uh, this kind of design approach, which by the way, comes out of how any culture over the centuries of human construction of the built environment would have approached a very low load, very environmental, uh, event, uh, environmentally appropriate building. It all starts with understanding the site, the climate that we're working with, choosing a massing and orientation strategy that is appropriate to maximize the energies avail available on site, thinking about that building enclosure, that environmental separator between inside and outside, and trying to do as much as possible with the passive approach, thinking about daylighting and, and then its relationship with lighting, and doing all of those things before you get into the active energy using systems on the building itself. So you could divide this pathway into elements, strategies that are directly related to the architecture of the building, and then also indirectly related um, strategies that will be applied as you go down this path. And I think that this is like a good way of thinking about it because it also relates to how we typically, the decisions that we make at typical uh, early stages of the design and then steadily more detailed decisions as we go. If you take this approach, it also helps you avoid jumping directly to the technology, jumping directly to 
the you know efficient mechanical systems or the additional addition of renewable energy systems you're really designing for a passive first approach which will have the biggest impact on the overall emissions for the entire lifespan of the building so i, I hope you can kind of see that logic there that we move from uh, passive strategies, and then once we've reduced the loads using architectural strategies first, then we're starting to consider what the mechanical, uh, the active systems of the building are. And finally, at the very bottom, the introduction of renewable energy. And you heard David say earlier, uh, you know, we may have to make allowances for um, not being able to get to a fully zero solution for every building on every building site because there's just not enough physical space to, to provide renewable energy on site. This is one way to make sure that we have the most efficient approach that way is to first reduce the energy and then to its smallest amount and then to consider adding renewables. So we can say some of these things in, in a kind of list form uh, start with siting and what that's going to mean. You may not have many options uh, for orientation, uh, but you could be thinking, uh, because it's a tight urban site, but you could be thinking about uh, the orientation with respect to the sun, wind, thinking about rain, thinking about its connection to the ground. All of those things are at least something that you should, you should talk about as, as a first step, uh, even if there are limited options because of the urban siting there. The shape and form of what you're going to build, uh, you know, we are going to, for the next 50 years at least, to be in what would be considered a cold climate. Uh, so thinking about a small compact form, a minimal amount of surface area, those are our key objectives to achieve in the design. And then also that, that relationship between the perimeter space in the building and the exterior uh, just trying to, to uh, maximize the, or sorry, minimize the amount of surface area relative to the enclosed space. Those are good steps, good strategies that you can use as you, as you start the design. You may be limited by shape and form because of the program and the amount that you have to fit onto the site itself. So you do what you can and then you move on to the next one. And certainly an exceptional building enclosure uh, when we're talking a well-insulated building, an airtight building, something that's designed to be durable that includes um, mechanisms for solar control to, to both, well, to re primarily to reduce cooling loads uh, for the building, but also to, to maximize daylight, reduce glare. Those, those are key considerations that no matter what site you're building on, you can, you can get into. And then we start to talk about using the most efficient equipment you can. Of course, no fossil fuel use is a, is a great starting point for a low carbon building and, and really trying to use those passive strategies so that you uh, can minimize the energy use required in the first place. Those are the, those are the priorities. Finally, then thinking about renewable energy uh, generation. Uh, the, so, so if we were to break these down into targets, sort of thinking about those, well, operational energy use, less than 75 equivalent kilowatt hours per square meter per year. That's, that's uh, as I would suggest, the absolute highest amount of energy that you would wanna design with. A subset of that, the thermal energy demand intensity, which really relates to the energy required for heating the building, uh, not counting the occupants of the building itself and, uh, and any energy related to the activity. The objective should be less than 15 equivalent kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Greenhouse gas intensity, aim for zero, go for low fossil fuel use. Uh, and and then, uh, then thinking about the building enclosure itself, I think we can get into some you know, even more specific recommendations here that I'll propose kind of as, as starting points. As I, go, as I go through these slides, I'm hoping that you guys are catching that the term enclosure is the secret code that's, uh, that's listed in here. That would be all capital letters. So what is an exceptional building enclosure? Uh, here's, a, here's a graph that's uh, commonly used to relate the amount of glazing area to the total, um, the total thermal resistance of the building enclosure itself. Uh, this is uh, just to highlight the importance of dealing with, with the amount of glazing as a starting point. Uh, 
if you're using each one of these curves, by the way, represents a different thermal resistance uh, for the solid wall area. And then also these curves are grouped into double glazed windows and triple glazed windows of, of different types. And, and what you can see along the bottom here is the amount of glazing and on the vertical axis, you can see the combined thermal resistance. In order to achieve an exceptional building enclosure, a very good thermal design, uh, we're looking for something in this zone in the middle, uh, the, the sort of 50-50 zone, approximately uh, no more than 50% glazing uh, and achieving an, a combined overall thermal resistance when you include the, the, the walls and windows together, uh, certainly above eight, I would say probably something uh, closer to uh, uh, 10 to 12 is, is the target. Uh, if you were designing uh, strictly to a passive house standard, this whole box would shift to the left. You would probably be restricted to 20 to 35 percent glazing and you would certainly have to be on the upper end of these triple glazed uh, curves here with an R30 or higher uh, enclosure. That just just to give you a sense of what your what you need to start with, it's got to at least be within this 50-50 zone, and most likely towards the upper left-hand part of the, of this uh, this grouping. And the enclosure characteristics themselves, and, and by the way, don't don't worry about like writing these down or screen capturing as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, I'll share a PDF of this presentation, and, and a lot of this is just for your reference as you, as a team, work to set targets later later in the week. Uh, what I've got here is sort of two lists of enclosure enclosure characteristics. Uh, the bottom ones are the kind of National Energy Code for Buildings minimum targets. Uh, this would be, you know, you would do no worse than these to do a uh, very high performance building, and the table at the top. Uh, we have described here as towards passive house, not quite a passive house level of performance, uh, but good values that would you would get you into that range. So they're both the uh, the metric and imperial uh, values are given here, uh, so that you can get a sense of what each one of those assemblies might be, as well as the air tightness of the building. And these aren't these aren't things that you're necessarily by the end of the week going to be able to execute fully in your proposal for the design. Uh, but it will point you in the direction of technical solutions. And when you're thinking about the energy analysis of the building overall, uh, point you in the direction of a very low load building, uh, which will make very efficient mechanical systems uh, possible and certainly uh, uh, maximize your use of renewable energy on site. Okay, so that's, that's probably what an exceptional building enclosure looks like. Less than 50% wall to window ratio, the towards passive house targets, and like absolutely minimal thermal bridging in the design of the building itself. You'll talk a lot more about building enclosure as you go through the week. But what about the embodied carbon part? That's another, uh, hasn't been talked about yet in this list of targets. And I wanted to reinforce that uh, uh, point that David made in the earlier presentation that embodied emissions uh, can be significant for buildings. And uh, as I've said already, they are occurring at the beginning of the building's service life, right during that uh, critical several decade period of time that we have to dramatically reduce emissions as much as possible. So they have to be considered. Here's, here's a rough um, breakdown for a typical building. Uh, if you wanted to look up Leddy and find their embodied carbon primer, uh, just in the lower left there, there's the, the reference. There's tons of information about embodied carbon, how to approach it. I think a, a good takeaway for you would be just to think about some of the, the bigger components of this. 30% uh, the superstructure of the building, not, not atypical for, for um, uh, most large buildings, the internal finishes, the foundation structure, the facade, uh, depending on the proportion of the building, like how high it is relative to the foundations, those, those percentages would move around a bit. Uh, the amount of mechanical stuff, MEP, uh, components to the building is, is not insignificant either. These are all things that we would think about when we're um, uh, analyzing the embodied emissions of the building itself. Uh, David had mentioned that 
you can get to the component level of analysis. And this is just one example on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, embodied carbon of a whole bunch of different building materials in CO2 per kilogram of material. And you know, you'll see the, the kind of uh, organic materials that, that uh, don't require a lot of manufacturing or transportation energy towards the bottom and the highly manufactured materials that have a lot of energy involved in their extraction from the earth and manufacturing at the top. Uh, what's a little bit misleading about these kind of charts for decision-making is that they're all per kilogram. And typically you need a lot of kilograms of bricks to build a building and not so much aluminum relative to the job it needs to do in terms of structurally at least. So you have to think about um, the materials for sure and what the embodied carbon is for each one of them, but also think about the volume of material and any uh, simple life cycle assessment program would, would essentially help you with that, just dealing with the quantities of materials and looking at the, the rough comparisons of the embodied emissions. Uh, David had mentioned insulation. One thing to, to pick out, you know, any one of these ins uh, material categories, you could do a more detailed breakdown and find that there are some materials that could provide that same function, that same, in this case, thermal insulation function, but you'll see that the embodied carbon is quite different for, for some of them compared to others. Um, when you're designing for the long term, uh, you can't just pick the lowest one. You know, uh, this, this graph would indicate that, you know, cork would be a, 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 an excellent choice because of its very low embodied carbon. But for certain applications in buildings, you just can't get well, cork either won't work or you can't get the durability that you would require over the long term. So you have to sort of think carefully about this. But as a designer, you're looking to identify where are the large amounts of material with uh, a big carbon emissions uh, uh, yeah, impact, where, what substitutions could I make uh, that would reduce that uh, wherever possible. And it, I, I would just wanted to run through this in case the, the point was missed about the importance of these early em emissions at construction. Here's a full life cycle view uh, showing in the darker color, the embodied emissions in the lighter color, the operating emissions. And if we were to look over the entire service life of a building that was, you know, so let's say built next year and lasting for 80 years or so, the operational energy of the building uh, would certainly be significant in a conventional building. It would account for something like 80% of the energy use in the building uh, compared to the embodied. However, um, we can easily ad adjust that based on some of these strategies that we've just talked about. We could reduce that at least by 50%, perhaps more. And so if we are designing a very low operating energy building like the targets that we're kind of talking about would suggest. Uh, well, you can see the pie chart on the right hand side changes pretty dramatically. Now we're talking about like two thirds is operational related. And if we talk about carbon, not just the energy, but the carbon itself and reduce the carbon intensity of the energy that we used by, for instance, using electricity and not fossil fuels, over the full life cycle of the building, it's more like a 50-50 and actually starting to prioritize the embodied carbon uh, over the 80 years, that's important. And again, that point that what really matters to the future climate and being able to stabilize what we're designing for over the long term and all the other impacts is the carbon that's emitted in the next few decades. And so when we look just at that first few decades, like 80% of the emissions are related to the embodied carbon. So yes, we want to do a very low energy building. That's what these, these targets, and I would recommend that you choose targets for high performance that result in a very low energy building over its operational life. But we also have to include that consideration for the upfront upfront embodied energy.
Okay. So if we were to translate that into something like a target that maybe maybe you could use for your analysis overall, I would su suggest that less than 300 kilograms of carbon dioxide per square meter of the building, uh, that's that, that would be a kind of maximum carbon weighting. And also that you do some sort of life cycle assessment to confirm that, even if it is just a rudimentary one that uh, estimates volumes of materials and and uh, maybe compares some options in your design thinking. That's the kind of stuff that we we need to be thinking about as as we go forward. And then what else for setting targets for a high performance building? There's all sorts of other things that I would encourage you to think about. And although I'm not going to talk about them in this session, indoor environmental uh, quality for for the building itself. I mean, this is a performance space and it has particular criteria for sound, for instance, and light control. I, those, are, those are things that you as designers can set specific targets for. But I would also encourage you to generally think about air quality, daylight, thermal comfort, other health related impacts, which could include chemical uh, exposure, sound, vibration, glare, view, all of these things as a designer, you can set design targets for that can guide your design. So definitely IEQ would be, would be part of this. Durability, we talked about that issue of designing for the longer term and having mechanisms built into your design for uh, reusing or ad adapting part of uh, the structure over time. You're gonna start with some existing building that you're, you're going to integrate into the new facility. That's a great start. Uh, what about over its life cycle? How can that building be uh, reconfigured? Um, in your introduction to this project program, the, there was some conversation about the flexibility that's required for a performance space over time. Are you designing for that? And are you designing for uh, use? That's a key aspect of designing a durable, uh, durable building. And then of course, thinking about end of life, that, that deconstruction of the building, perhaps uh, maybe connecting some of that thinking to uh, designing for a circular economy, those might be considerations that you you choose as performance related targets for your building. And resilience was mentioned in the, the uh, uh, presentation uh, by the City of Toronto. Uh, it Resilience for your facility is directly related to that future climate that we're going to be designing for. Passive survivability might be one thing that you think about for the building. How does it operate in a condition where it doesn't have access to, to power? Uh, is there enough energy uh, on site to accommodate uh, operation of the building? Can the building uh, become uh, a refuge for the city in the case of an, a, a climate related emergency over time? Uh, even just thinking about things about the ease of repair or replacement uh, as the building goes through its service life are, are pretty key. So although I'm, I'm not going to suggest like specific targets in each one of these areas, there are a lot of other performance related targets that you could, could be thinking about at an early stage in your, in your design process. And then uh, just to make it one step more complicated, your task here is also to do great architecture. And I, I know that this all sounds very complicated, like this task of integrating ultra low emission uh, performance with great architecture. But I think as designers entering the building industry, this is really the challenge that will define your career. And in fact, I can't think of a more exciting challenge to tackle uh, in terms of its social relevance, in terms of its long-term impact. We need designers to be able to do uh, climate appropriate buildings. And it is going to have a, a major impact on the crisis that we face uh, and a continuing impact over the centuries to come. So this is something that not only will probably define your career, the kinds of things that you're going to get experience with uh, during this week, uh, but it, it will also be uh, something that I think you're very well suited for by nature of the, the fact that you're involved in this kind of integrated exercise. Being able to put this all together is a key skill set that will help address the climate crisis. Okay, so that's that's the whole whole list of things that I, I have to talk about that relate to setting uh, performance targets for the building. Uh, I I'd be happy to answer questions if you have them right now. I, I also put my email address here in case you have questions uh, during the week. I'd be happy to answer them. 
I, I'm hoping to be back on, on Friday at least to see your presentations and I'm pretty excited to, to see what you guys uh, come up with after all of the information and thinking that you're going to do this week. Okay, any questions? We got about 10 minutes. Alex, we have one in the chat from Brianne. Yes. Uh, the last couple of slides that show pie charts, bar charts of embodied carbon versus operational carbon and discuss the importance of considering the impact of embodied carbon were so inspirational. Thanks for including those. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you found them useful. And I, I really think that that, like if you think about it in that full life cycle uh, perspective, I think it, it puts into focus how important uh, the, all of those design decisions are about what, how you build the building and then how it works over time. That is really the task that, that you have to address as, uh, as designers. Students, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question. There's a lot to think about. And if you, I would suggest that uh, when you get the PDF of this slide, you know, if you're, if you're kind of looking for a place to start, go back to that triangle, that inverted pyramid uh, and, and think through that. That's, uh, that's something that you can at least start digging into right away uh, with, your, uh, with your group as you're thinking about these solutions. And I know that over the next couple of days, you're gonna get, well, this afternoon and over the next couple of days, you're gonna get, uh, a lot of very specific information that will relate to each one of those steps in designing a very low load building. So hopefully that will be a, something that you can use as a, a simplified method that you can integrate all this other information into. Amkar, do you have a question? You have, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to know your opinion on uh, uh, the status quo, like, for example, for this project, uh, what do you think uh, should be a strategy or is it even a strategy to uh, just use the building as it is right now? Well, hey, look, I, I think we have to ask that question right off the bat, right? Like if, if we go back to that that slide where it, it shows uh, this pie chart here, 82% the embodied emissions in the building. Well, a key strategy to impact that first bar would be to reuse existing construction. You get the foundations for free. You get most of the building enclosure for free. The primary structure is, is already there. Now, it's not gonna be possible in each case, but that's always the first question we should be asking. What can we, how much can we reuse? And that could reduce 50% of that or maybe more. That's not to say that you don't have a challenge in, in converting an existing building to a high performance building. You, you already got a little bit of conversation about that this morning, the different pathways there. But I, I think th this would be my opinion. You got to ask that question first and do as much as you possibly can to, uh, to move forward. Thank you. I see another question here. It says, there are a lot of moving parts in development and construction and a lot of siloed off conversations and knowledge. It doesn't transfer from one design phase to another. How can we address this gap? You know what, I think, uh, Bianca, I think that this is more than the technical problems. This is the, the real challenge for, for any designer entering the industry right now. We have a very efficient construction industry that works efficiently primarily because people specialize in different areas. What you're gonna see here this week is kind of the, the opposite of that. This is how we're going to address that gap by having conversations as one group, by hearing from a whole bunch of different experts who are used to having that conversation and integrating these decisions together. So I don't have a, a ready solution other than we should be having more of these conversations. But I do know, I do agree with your point and I do know that we're only going to overcome that siloed approach if we have more shared conversations and deliberately look to build expertise and understanding from one silo to another. And I, I think you guys are gonna learn a lot about that this week all the way to the end of the week. Uh, Adam asks, uh, can you, speak to specifying new technologies when the industry is so entrenched with proven technologies. For example, uh, people are still scared to install geo exchange. 
Uh, well, look, for good reason, our building industry is very conservative in their decision making. It's not just about the efficiency and, and making money, although that's certainly part of it. But if you think about our, you know, we're building uh, buildings that last for, for decades, potentially hundreds of years. We have a conservative approach to, to using things that we have some familiarity with at this moment we have access to all sorts of new technologies or ways of putting together technologies that we already have that have not been proven by decades of experience. So I, I, I think this is a major challenge. This is one of the reasons why you know, I, I have a building science background. So I, I would say, well, a scientific approach to analyzing performance, predicting ahead of time, feeding back information about uh, actual performance into your design phases are critical. The building science approach is, is uh, key, uh, but I, I think there's no substitute for uh, that, that demonstration um, and, and quick feedback of information from one project to another. I, I don't think we're ever really gonna fully remove uh, people being scared to install new technology or to try new technologies, but I think that we can speed up the process of integration if we, again, share information as, as quickly as possible. We've got a very limited amount of time to do that. You know, a couple decades is not much more than a few project cycles from start to finish, so it's not like we can build a prototype, let it sit around for 20 or 30 years until we get some experience with it, and then get people to integrate it, we have to, to work faster than that. An associated point that I would make is that our building industry is thousands of years long in terms of our experience. And I think that although, yes, we want to integrate new technologies, some of the solutions that we have to bring to the table as an industry, we already have centuries of experience with. We may have just forgotten about it in the last 150 years. So we can be digging back into the past to, to find daylighting strategies, passive ventilation strategies, solar orientation strategies that have always been used by humans building buildings everywhere on the planet. And we can bring those back and they are certainly something that we don't need to be scared to implement into buildings. So this kind of, depending on what kind of technology you're talking about, whether it's a primarily passive one or active one, I think maybe either uh, looking back to the past to get that experience or to um, uh, do that, so that, that fast communication of, of actual experience uh, so that we can get people more familiar with these new technologies we're going to integrate. Okay, coming up on time, still two minutes left and then, then we automatically move to the next session. Any other questions? All right. Well, I will uh, send a, a PDF of the, the presentation so that every, everyone has that uh, and, and can look at it later. And as, as I said, my email address is here. You're welcome to uh, email me at any time if you, if you have, want to follow up on any of, any of what we've talked about so far. Thanks for participating in the, in the presentation and good luck this week in your groups. Thank you, Alex. It was amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. And if everyone can jump into 